Hello there, AP Environmental Science class. Moving on now to chapter 12, we're going to talk about food production and the environment, uh, which actually works out kind of nicely because the previous unit uh, talked about geology and soil uh, and, and mineral resources. And now, you know, what do we use that soil for? We use that soil uh, for food production. So uh, th this uh, chapter, we'll talk about food production and how it affects the environment. Uh, what you're going to learn is that a lot of the ways we produce our food is actually not good for the environment. Environment, not good for biodiversity. Uh, and again, that's what we're going to discuss uh, in this chapter. Uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at things, uh, there are a little over 80 slides here, I think 82 slides. So uh, like a couple of chapters ago, I will chop this into three, not two uh, um, lectures for you guys. Again, just a little easier for me uh, and, and a little bit easier for you. All right, so let's get right to it. Again, chapter 12, food production and the environment. So uh, first it starts with a core case study uh, talking about growing power and urban food oasis. Uh, basically, it talks about a food desert. Uh, this is an urban area where people have little to no easy access to nutritious food, okay? A food desert. Uh, growing Power Incorporated is uh, located in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. It's an ecologically based farm uh, that uses solar power. It produces a 150 varieties of organic produce, nutrients recycled in creative ways, and also provides education and training in organic farming methods. All right, again, this is uh, this is just a picture of uh, of that of that facility uh, in, in in Wisconsin. All right, so uh, why is good nutrition important? Well, many people in less developed countries have health problems because they don't get enough food. Uh, many people in more developed countries uh, suffer health problems from eating too much, all right? So it's kind of, <laughs> kind of uh, both sides of the coin here uh, provide humans, unfortunately, with health problems. You eat too little, you eat too much. So that's all part of nutrition. Uh, nutrition doesn't necessarily mean you don't get enough food. Uh, again, for many folks, uh, they're getting too many nutrients, all right? Especially in uh, more developed countries uh, like here in the United States. <clears throat> Greatest obstacle to providing enough food for everyone, poverty, war, bad weather, and of course, climate change uh, causing uh, a big issue as well. So unfortunately, we see stuff like this. Uh, this is a very difficult picture to look at. Um, it's tough. This is a tough picture to look at, okay? But obviously, you have a child there uh, that is suffering from uh, severe malnutrition. Uh, his mother is trying to feed him, uh, but unfortunately, this is occurring in many parts of the world, especially in those uh, less developed countries uh, because they just don't have the nutrition, the availability uh, of, of nutrition like we do here in the United States. So many people suffer from lasting hunger and malnutrition. All right. So a couple of terms you'll need to know uh, as we begin to talk about this uh, subject. Macronutrients, all right, are your carbohydrates, your proteins, and your fats. All right. They are called macronutrients. Micronutrients are going to be your vitamins and minerals. So examples, vitamins A, B, C, C and E, uh, and minerals, iron, iodine, and calcium are just an example of some minerals uh, that we need to, uh, to have proper nutrition in our body. So uh, chronic undernutrition, what is that? Well, that means that you don't have enough food to meet your basic energy needs. Chronic malnutrition means you don't have enough protein or other key nutrients uh, to uh, to uh, in, in, in uh, getting into your body. All right. So again, we have undernutrition and we have malnutrition. Famine is going to be a severe shortage of food, uh, maybe crop failures due to crop, maybe flooding, maybe war. And obviously famine was going to cause mass starvation, many deaths, economic chaos, uh, and social disruption. So that's what we're trying uh, to obviously avoid. All right. So let's take a little uh, closer look at micronutrients. All right. These are your vitamins and minerals. Two billion people are deficit in one or more vitamins and minerals. So think about that. We have about what? Uh, we said over about 7.5 billion people, right? So about 2 billion uh, are, are deficit in at least one or more of those of those vitamins. Uh, so uh, too little iron is, is, uh, causes something that is known as anemia. Um, my grandmother uh, suffered from 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 uh, anemia when she was alive, so that's not something that necessarily uh, is just uh, just get when you live in an underdeveloped country. That can happen here in the U.S. as well. Uh, iodine is an important uh, an, an, an important mineral. It's essential for your thyroid to function, uh, and a chronic a lack of iodine causes stunted growth, mental retardation, and something called goiter, uh, which is another type of disease. 
But then again, we have the health problems from eating too much, right? So it's not just about being malnourished or undernourished. You could have overnutrition problems, and that's where excess body fat from too many calories and too little exercise form. And believe it or not, folks, and this is what's so interesting, that if you're malnourished or you're overnourished, believe it or not, you have similar health problems. Lower life expectancy, greater susceptibility to disease and illness. So think about COVID. What did they say? One of the main uh, issues to get COVID in, 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 in a very uh, bad way uh, are people who are overweight, right? That, that was one of the, one of the uh, uh, characteristics we seem to be seeing. Uh, so again, overweight, underweight, you're going to have the same type of problems, and that is going to produce lower productivity and lower life quality as well. So poverty, unfortunately, is the root cause of hunger and malnutrition. You probably guessed that uh, because most of our, our poverty and our malnutrition is occurring in these underdeveloped countries, even though uh, we still have some of this in, 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 in the United States as well, especially in some of our urban centers. Half of the world's people struggle to survive on $2.25 per day. Think about that, guys. Think about what you do with $2.25. I mean, I go hit a bucket of golf balls. It costs me six bucks, right? Six bucks to hit balls takes about 20 minutes. That $6 could uh, feed someone in another country for two and a half days. Think about that. All right. So think about it when you, you know, buy that special. My daughter uh, loves Starbucks and loves to buy, uh, you know, special bottled water there. That's like $10. Think about that. That's five days of food for someone living in one of these underdeveloped countries, all right? So $2.25 a day. Poverty prevents daily access to nutritious food. Other obstacles to food security. Again, we talk about this. Uh, we talked about it previously. You have war. You have a, 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 a corruption in the, in the, uh, in, in the government. Uh, maybe you have some food coming in. They're not giving it to, 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 to the right people. Bad weather. And, of course, that climate change uh, is a problem as well. So... How is food produced, all right? We talked about in the first section about how uh, many people in underdeveloped nations don't have enough, enough food. So how is it produced, all right? And, and, and can we look at this food production and, and maybe try to, try to produce more food uh, 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 for, for these folks? So we have used high-input industrialized agriculture and low-input traditional agriculture to greatly increase food supply. So that's actually a positive. We have greatly increased our food supplies uh, over the last 50 to 100 years using a combination of high input industrial agriculture and low input traditional agriculture. And as we go through the next couple of slides, we're going to talk about uh, what the difference is uh, between the high input and the, and, and the low input. All right. But again, food production has increased dramatically. There are three systems that produce most of our food. First, croplands. All right. And on your crop lands, you're going to get your grains. All right. Primarily rice, wheat and corn. Then we have our range lands, our pastures and our feedlots that are going to produce meat and meat products. And then we have fisheries and aquaculture. We'll talk about that a little bit, uh, which provide our fish products. All right. So we got crop lands for grains, range lands, pastures, feedlots for meat and fisheries and aquaculture for your fish. Important technological advances have, has helped us in the past 50 to 100 years inc increase our food production dramatically. And that, mean, and that uh, includes irrigation, synthetic fertilizers, and pesticides. And we're going to talk all about these things uh, as we go through uh, this chapter. So industrialized crop production relies on high input monocultures. What the heck does that mean? All right. So industrialized agriculture. This is not your mom and pop uh, farms. This is huge farms that are industrialized. They use heavy equipment. They use large amounts of financial capital, fossil fuels, water, inorganic fertilizers, and pesticides. They also only produce a single crop, which we'll get into, but that is a, a killer for biodiversity because there's no diversity. Uh, all right, so you're planting a, a crop, all corn for as far as the eye can see. Okay, that unfortunately uh, is something called monoculture, and that's a and that's a single crop, and, and that is a killer for biodiversity. But the major goal is a steadily increase in your crop yield. So that's what industrialized agriculture has done for us. So even though it has destroyed uh, the environment in many cases, it has 
uh, dramatically increase the amount of food uh, uh, that that we are producing. Uh, plantation agriculture. This is where your cash crops, uh, primarily now in less developed countries. All right, this is what uh, you know back in the uh, the 17, 1800s here in the U.S. This was your cotton and 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 your tobacco. All right, now we don't do that in the U.S., but in some less developed countries, uh, they still have these plantation agriculture where they produce those cash crops like uh, like cotton and and and. Uh, tobacco. So this is your monoculture. All right. As you can see, as far as the eye can see here, there's wheat. You see nothing else. Okay. There is not a tree. There's not a bush. It's not any type of other, uh, any, any other type of biological entities here. Right. It's just wheat for as far as you can see. All right. And this is what your high input monocultures look like. This is what it's all about. Okay. So you now then, um, kind of compare that to the traditional agriculture and traditional agriculture often relies on low input polyculture so if monoculture is one plot uh, one type of of crop polyculture is going to be many uh, different types of crops growing together. This is your traditional subsidence agriculture that people started doing uh, thousands of years ago. Human labor and draft animals provide the family food. Traditional intensive agriculture, all right, so you get, uh, it's a little bit higher yield through increased labor, animal manure, and water, all right, so what has happened is the traditional subsidence agriculture from hundreds of years ago, now we call it traditional intensive agriculture because we are getting some more or yields through that increased labor, through animal manure for fertilizer, uh, and through that irrigation, that water. Once again, what's a polyculture? Several crops grown on the same farm. And again, it has many benefits over monoculture uh, because uh, of the increase in the, or at least the sustaining of the biodiversity. We'll talk about how that helps, uh, especially when we get to pesticides in just a couple of slides. Uh, we'll talk about how having a polyculture uh, type of farm actually helps uh, helps fight pests naturally uh, compared to those uh, one of those high input industrialized monocultural farms all right there's also organic agriculture and it's on the rise right now it is uh, it is one of those uh, the last 10 15 years you'll notice in supermarkets for instance you have that that organic section uh, is getting bigger and bigger uh, eight places like Trader Joe's uh, I don't know if they have any here in Westchester but uh, I know there's a few over where I live on the other side of the river. Again, just having organic uh, produce there. So organic agriculture are crops grown without synthetic pesticides or fertilizers. All right. No genetically engineered seed varieties. So no GMOs. All right. Animals, if they are going to be organic, must be raised with 100 percent organic feed without antibodies or any growth hormones. Organic agriculture obviously is going to be more labor intensive than conventionally produced food, and it's going to cost more. So I'll be honest with you, I don't shop at Trader Joe's because I uh, don't want to spend 300 and 400 bucks a week on food. We spend about two to 300 uh, in my family on food. Uh, and so I honestly, and maybe I should, but I don't, I don't use the organic at this point uh, because it is just a little bit too expensive. But hopefully as we get down the road here, uh, and as we use our brains and our technology, uh, that we can get those prices down. Down, uh, so that more folks can uh, can buy uh, that organic agriculture. So uh, again, here's just kind of a chart. I would definitely understand uh, a couple of the pros and cons of each. So industrial agriculture, again, uh, are, these are not necessarily pros or cons, but kind of the characteristics. Uh, industrial agriculture uses synthetic inorganic fertilizers and sewage sludge to supply plant nutrients. All right. Uh, synthetic inorganic means we are making them. Okay, they are chemically made, uh, makes use of, of synthetic chemical pesticides. Again, we're making them chemically made, uses conventional and genetically modified seeds. Those are your GMOs to get your higher, uh, your higher yields. Uh, depends on non-renewable fossil fuels, mostly oil and natural gas. You got to run these big equipment uh, somehow, right? Uh, produces significant air and water pollution and greenhouse gases because of those fossil fuels. Uh, is globally export oriented. So it's not about... Uh, it's not about having it near your house or locally grown. It's about exporting it throughout the world. And again, uses antibiotics and growth hormones to produce meat and meat products. Compare that to organic agriculture. Emphasizes pre prevention of soil erosion and use of organic fertilizers. Those aren't ones that we make. Those are ones that are natural, such as animal manure and compost. 
but no sewage sludge to supply plant nutrients. Employs crop rotation and biological pest control. We're going to talk about that uh, in a couple of slides, but you can actually, by having um, more of a polyculture, you have natural pest controls that are there, uh, natural insects, uh, uh, other types of, of animals that eat pests, uh, and they can it can, without using synthetic pesticides, can actually uh, help uh, keep your crop safe. No GMO seeds, reduces fossil fuel use, and, and increases use of renewable energy, such as solar and wind power. Produces less air and water pollution and greenhouse gases because we're not using such big, big equipment. Um, it's regionally and locally oriented. So once again, you're not putting it in a tractor trailer and sending it across country with all those, uh, using all those fossil fuels. Uh, basically, uh, the stuff is grown and eaten right where it's grown. Uh, and it uses no antibiotics or growth hormones to produce meat and meat products. All right. So just kind of definitely uh, have a general idea uh, of some of the differences in, in characteristics between that industrial agriculture and that organic agriculture. All right, a closer look at industrialized uh, crop production. All right, so the green revolution uh, is something that increases our or increased our crop yields. Uh, so this happened uh, actually down back in the earlier 1900s. All right, uh, this was or the kind of the mid 1900s or so monocultures of high yield crops, right? Uh, rice, wheat, and corn, large amounts of fertilizers, pesticides, and water irrigation was used, and you have multiple uh, multiple croppings, all right, meaning that throughout the year, you're going to have a couple of harvests, all right? So this was the first green revolution that, again, happened kind of in the middle of the 1900s, uh, or the last century, the 20th century. Now, the second green revolution has happened in the past uh, 30, 20 to 30 years or so, and this is now where we gen genetically modified uh, the seeds, so now you have fast-growing varieties of, of, of rice and wheat, and you can get so many more crops throughout the year, and actually world grain production has tripled between 1950 and 2014 because of both of these green revolutions that have happened, all right? So what basically uh, technology increased in the 20th century, we, we figured out about all these chemical fertilizers, pesticides, uh, irrigation, and so we started to create all this food. It was great, uh, but now we're noticing that, unfortunately, uh, after you know 70 years or so of this, uh, that a lot of the stuff that we're doing, the large amounts of fertilized pesticides and water, are actually starting to maybe decrease our yields a little bit uh, because of the uh, the fact that it's not helping uh, the environment and, and 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 the biodiversity. So that's what we're kind of finding out now that these green revolutions uh, that have occurred while in many respects we're good because it produced much more food, uh, in many respects now we're starting to uh, see uh, a, a little bit of, of, of the consequences of that. Uh, so you'll notice here's just a graph, closer look at industrialized, uh, industrialized crop production. Uh, you'll notice the years on the uh, x-axis and how much are going up the y. And as you can just see from 1950 to now, uh, it's continued that that, that upward trend of production. So case study, uh, talking about a little bit more about the industrialized food production in the U.S. We have agro, agribusiness, which means a few giant multinational corporations that are controlling the growing, processing, distribution, and the sale of food. Again, food production is very efficient at this point. Americans spend about 9% of their income on food, uh, but the actual cost of the food much higher, uh, hidden costs of subsidies, pollution, uh, and of course that environmental degradation not necessarily uh, put into the full cost pricing uh, of that food. So crossbreeding and genetic engineering produce new varieties of crops and livestock. All right. So again, just kind of talking about this a little bit. Uh, we had that first gene revolution where crossbreeding through artificial selection occurred. This was a slow process, but had amazing results. Uh, and now the second green revolution or the second gene revolution is the genetic engineering. We talked about this in a previous chapter. And again, this is where we all to an organism's DNA uh, and have these genetically modified organisms, GMOs, uh, that are trans uh, transgenic organisms, okay? So we are creating them. We are making them. So the first one was just kind of crossbreeding, uh, and that had happened. Uh, actually, there, was, there are actually some... Uh, some some uh, some some history or some uh, that the ancient Egyptians uh, kind of knew about uh, how to how to do some uh, crossbreeding uh, uh, with genes. But then, of course, now with technology, we do that genetic engineering uh, where we can actually alter an organism's uh, DNA. All right. So now we're going to talk. That was uh, basically talking about uh, food, uh, uh, growing food, so crops.
Uh, now we're going to talk a little bit more about meat. All right. Meat consumption has grown steadily. Uh, meat production increased more than sixfold between 1950 and 2010. Pork, poultry, and beef are your top products. Uh, there's also that increased demand for grain because what eats grain? Not only humans eat grain, but pigs chickens and cows, right? So now you have more of the, you need more uh, greater reliance on these grain imports. A lot of our grain imports, uh, for instance, come from, from China. Uh, and so now you have some issues uh, politically there. All right, about half of the world's meat are going to be raised on rangelands uh, and half are gonna be in a, in a kind of a factory farm system. Uh, so meat consumption, there you go, once again, uh, year on the x-axis, how much meat we're eating off up the y, and as you can see, it increasing dramatically. Look at uh, look at China. Uh, look at China there, how, how much uh, it, it is increasing. The left one is global. The right one shows U.S. and China. Our meat production is increasing, but look how rapidly China's uh, meat, meat production uh, is increasing um, over there. And this is uh, basically uh, what we're talking about, those industrial feedlots. Look at that, guys. You can just see cows for miles and miles and miles. Uh, and again, this is kind of your uh, industrialized, not agriculture, this is your industrialized meat meat production where you have thousands of animals living together. And then of course, uh, they will go to the slaughterhouse uh, and then eventually uh, into, on. Um, Will be someone's will be someone's meal. All right, uh, fish and self uh, shellfish production are also growing very rapidly. So we talked about uh, crops, meat, and now we'll talk about fish a little bit. All right, officially, a uh, fishery is a concentration of a particular species suitable for commercial harvesting. Thirty percent, though, of these fisheries are overfished, and fifty percent have been harvested at full capacity. So unfortunately, uh, these concentrations, these fisheries, or these concentrations of a particular species species of fish suitable for commercial harvesting, uh, unfortunately, are being over harvest. So we come up with something called aquaculture, which is basically fish farming. Okay, uh, amount of fish and cell food produced globally through aquaculture has increased 12 fold from 1980 to 2014. So this is a rather recent uh, within the last 40 years or so. Uh, and this is because the wild catch has actually now leveled off and, 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 and uh, declined a little bit. Farming of meat eating species are growing rapidly. So a fed fish meal or fish oil produced from other fish. So you actually uh, have to farm these meat eating species. Uh, and so then you need to feed them meat. Um, so they're fed fish meal or, or fish oil produced from other fish. All right. And of course, this is just uh, this is just uh, increasingly increasing the rapid decline uh, uh, of our fisheries here. And once again, just kind of showing here's the wild catch up at the top, kind of leveling off. Look at the aquaculture since 1980 has been uh, increasing dramatically. And again, that is your fish farming. All right. Uh, industrialized, industrialized food production requires used inputs of energy. So again, I don't care if that's industrialized farming, if that's industrialized meat production, or if that's industrialized uh, aquaculture, they're all going to require huge inputs of energy. Mostly, unfortunately, is non-renewable energy like oil and natural gas. I want you to think about this. 10 units of fossil fuel energy used for every unit of food energy in the U.S. Think about that, all right? We're just, the unit doesn't have to be any, this could be anything, any unit, all right? For one unit of food energy, all right, let's say I need one unit of food energy to have me in, eat that 10 units of fossil fuel energy was what was used. Okay. So that unfortunately is a huge problem with industrial food production that we've seen now over the past uh, 50 to 80 years. Again, we thought it was great back in the mid 1900s. We're finally feeding people, finally producing great yields with our crops, good stuff. Uh, and now we're realizing that it's actually not that great. Uh, because again, look at all this fossil fuel energy that we are using. Amount of energy per calorie used in the U.S. has declined 50% since the 1970s. So that is some good news. All right. It's actually gotten better, believe it or not. Uh, less energy required to produce nitrogen fertilizer uh, and the rising use of conservation tillage. And we'll talk more about uh, that tillage or how you farm uh, uh, as we go uh, through the rest of this chapter. All right. So that's going to be the end of part one uh, of this chapter. And uh, you'll have to come back for parts two and three of chapter 11. Actually, chapter 12. See you then.